Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today evening. And I'll speak today on the topic of how the good can be the enemy of the best and also the friend of the best. So what do I mean here by the good and the best? So I'll take this class in three parts. First I will give a philosophical context about what we mean by good and best. Then I will talk briefly a story from the Ramayana along with some other scriptural incidents and then we'll have a concluding part to bring it all together and you can have questions after each of the three parts as well as at the end we have time so in general life forces all of us to make choices sometimes the choices are small okay today evening when we cook food, I cook food at home, should I cook this item or that item? Or, it can be, sometimes it can be a big choice. Should I take this job or that job? Should I marry this person or that person? Should I stay in this country or immigrate to that country? Basically, during our life, constantly, we have to make choices. And, normally when we make choices, Actually, what is the basis on which we make those choices? We all have a certain framework. So for example, uh, we have certain priorities, certain purposes, based on which we choose. Okay, this is what I want to do in my life, and by doing this, if this can also be done, it's good. But if this can't be done, this is what I want to do. So if you are going, say, uh, to meet someone, and along the way there is a fast food center, or a food center, where some attractive snacks are there. So now we want to eat that along the way. Now, if there's a long queue over there and you have to wait for half an hour, one hour, you might say, not worth it. Forget it. But if we are just going for a leisurely tour and we're just going for fun, okay, no point, I'll wait, wait for some, no problem, I'll wait for some time. So basically when we make a choice, on what is the basis on which you make the choice? Usually, it is not just how much we like it or we don't like it. But it is also how much this will influence that which is most important for me. So basically, there are whatever things we have in our life, there is a hierarchy of importance for them. So for example, we want to, we want to say, have food that tastes good. But at the same time, you know, just the food that tastes good may not always be healthy. So you may have one item which just tastes is good, but then other items are which are healthy. So when we eat food, it is not just the food that tastes good. So tasting good is one value. But health is another value. And in a this hierarchy, if the, the health is put at a very high level, and taste is not considered at all. Then what happens? Eating becomes an austerity. So, like children I do told, eat your broccolis. So now broccoli is like a symbol of a food that is healthy but not tasty. And you have to force somebody to eat it. So if there is no play, no no taste, but it's only, it's not delicious but only nutritious, then we don't feel much pleasure eating it. But it's only delicious and not nutritious. Then what happens? Then it is, it will be delicious for some time, but it can be vicious for our health in the long run. Mm -hmm. So basically, <clears throat> food that is delicious is good. <clears throat> but food that is nutritious is even better. And food that is delicious and nutritious is the best. So this is a hierarchy of values. But sometimes some people take some food which are actually neither delicious nor nutritious. Sometimes some people may take some food which is extremely spicy. When they eat it, your tears come from their eyes. But then they feel, they feel stimulated by that. You know, now, it's done. now for their particular body, it might be nutritious also, we don't know. But for most people, it may not be. So, just as in food, there is a hierarchy and there can be good, better and best. 
So similarly, just as food is what we need in our life, broadly speaking, in our life, what is the purpose that we live for? And how does that purpose de affect our various values in life? That is what we'll be discussing. So broadly speaking, there are three kinds of actions we could say. There is vikarma, there is karma, and there is akarma. Or another way to put it is pap, punya, and bhakti. So what, 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 is, what does this mean? So pap or sin is action that might be pleasant right now, but it has terrible consequences. So it is action which we don't when we don't consider the consequences at all. It says somebody steps down from a 10-story building. Steps out. Now they may forget gravity, but gravity won't forget them. <laughs> they will come crashing it out. So what happens is that when we are in the lower modes, when our consciousness is not at all clear, then we don't even think of what I am doing. So punya, so papa is like, there might be very little immediate pleasure, but there is a lot of trouble that comes out of it. Now punya, on the other hand, is where we do something material to get something better material. So for we, we do means we sacrifice something materially to get something better materially. In fact, this is one of the most significant differences between humans and animals. That you know what are the four activities common to humans and animals? Eating, 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 Speech, consciousness, what did he say? They can do bhakti, animals cannot do bhakti. They can do bhakti, animals can't do bhakti. Yes. And also they can feel what is humans, human beings can feel what is right and what is wrong. What is right and what is wrong, yes. Choice. Choice, that's true. Intelligence is Intelligence. Yeah, all these are pointing in the direction. The, let's look at it first from a, maybe a scientific perspective, then we'll come to a more experiential and a scriptural perspective. See, all living beings have impulses. Impulses means, hey, I feel like doing something, I do it. So for example, a few days ago was Ekadashi. So now, we human beings might decide, might see delicious food, but it's Ekadashi, I won't eat it. Now if a cat sees a mouse, the cat can't think, oh, today they cut the sheep. <laughs> <laughs> if the impulse to eat comes, it will immediately eat. So basically, all, of, all living beings, just by being in a particular body, have impulses. Animals largely are slaves of their impulse. The impulse comes and they give it to it. Now, when the impulse comes, it's not necessarily that they're unintelligent. They might also use their intelligence to fulfill their impulse. So for example, if a tiger wants to catch a deer, and the deer is here, the tiger is here, the wind is flowing this way. And the tiger knows that the deer will smell me. The tiger may go all the way around and then attack from the other side. So the, in a sense, the intelligence is there. So when we say somebody is impulsive, that doesn't mean that they lack intelligence. It just means that their impulse is fulfilled intelligently. The intelligence is not used to evaluate the impulse. The intelligence is used to fulfill the impulse. So, there's a, so intelligence, or in one sense, all living beings have. But the intelligence to check the impulse. Check can be used in two senses. Check means, you know, is this worth fulfilling? And I'm getting this impulse, but I'll stop it. So that intelligence animals don't have. So, what is a choice or conscience? That's also correct in that sense. That means we might get an urge to do something, but 
if our if our intelligence is strong, then although the impulse comes, we can evaluate the impulse. And you can say, I don't want to fulfill this impulse. And this, at its fullest extent, is directed towards spirituality. So by this in, by this capacity to check impulse, we can look beyond short-term things to long-term things. So for example, we human beings spend a lot of time <coughs> Educating our next generation. No other species spends so much time as the education that is given all the, all species. But it is very functional kind of education. But we only spend a lot of time educating our children because by this the whole idea of education at one level is to see beyond the immediate, to see the long term. The whole principle of education is a child. And just play, or even a child can start working around something. Or a child, or a child, or a youth, uh, a teenager can also work, take a job, and earn something. But what they are doing when they are educating is now studies might not be enjoyable for everyone, but they are at least guided by the parents and by the development of their own intelligence. In a sense, they are trading the present for the future. The present, whatever enjoyment I might get, I will sacrifice that so that I can get more in the future. So this capacity to restrain our impulses and look for something in the future, to see the long term, that is a human capacity. In fact, every field, even science, if we see, how does it develop? It is, scientists may do a hundred or thousand experiments to try to arrive at one insight. Now they could just function with whatever knowledge they have, but, okay, I'm not getting any understanding by this. But I'll keep I'm doing it. Why? So I'll keep doing this. So that I'll be able to move forward in my life. The idea is that the scientists, they have an existing level of knowledge why they might be able to work. But they might do 100, 1000, 5000 experiments. But because they want to get some more insight. And that insight might transform the way we function in the world. So the basic point I'm making is that we human beings have the capacity to sacrifice the present for the future which other species don't have. Other species. Now, sometimes our species prepare for the future also. Say, whenever um, if the seasons are going to change, birds might transmig birds might migrate from one country to another country. But it is not by conscious planning. Just, it is like they have, a, they have instinct which just tells them go there. They don't make a conscious plan. That's why a bird can build a very intelligent nest, very artistic nest. But it is not that each bird will keep preparing a better and better nest. It's not that say you put 100 birds together and they will have a nest building competition. And who has built the best nest? And sometimes in fairy tales you might have competition among birds also. <laughs> but in real life, the birds, even if they have artistry, that artistry is, is not done by conscious choice. It is just by, you could say, programmed intelligence that is there. But the intelligence to question our programming, to direct our programming, to reprogram ourselves, that is distinctly there in humans. So because we have the conscience to choose right or wrong, that's how actually we can do more good than other species and we can also do more bad than other species. We don't generally don't talk about animals as being evil. You know, hey, if a tiger eats a deer, the tiger is not evil. Because the tiger is acting simply according to its its bodily rights. But as a human being kills come someone, that's evil. So when we talk about the bad, the good and the best. So the bad is papa. The good is punya. And the best is bhakti. And how are these three related with our preceding discussion of impulses? So, impulse and intelligence. 
So when we human beings are simply impulsive, we soon degenerate towards pap. We start degenerating towards wrong way. You want to eat food, you just keep going, whatever tastes good, whatever tastes good. Then what happens is that we might just kill brutally. To eat. Now that we have organized uh, slaughterhouses, which are horrible. I was just was in Hawaii, and <clears throat> there's one devotee couple who were hosting me. So the devotee Mat- Mataji, she was from a, one of the, um, by, she was one of the uh, Soviet Russia states. I think it was Bailo Russia, or one of those states. So she was telling that they were in that country. That their profession was, they would cook and sell crabs. Now crabs are among the only animals in the world which are cooked alive. You know, they, they're aquatics and somehow it's said that when you, if you, if their body gets decomposed and a lot of, a lot of germs and stuff come in and they become very sick. So actually you catch the crab and put it in hot water. You can see it. Suffering, suffering, suffering. And yes, that was their profession. He said that, and I never thought it was wrong because this is what every one of us are doing. But then when I came, when I was in, when I read Prabhupada's books and I understood Bhakti, says, what am I doing? She stopped it immediately. And it created like a furor in her family. What is this is our profession? How can we stop this? So, but somehow she was very firm and then she continued it. But the point I'm making here is that the search for pleasure, if we are governed only by impulses, now, now one animal might kill another animal, but which animal will like will put a will torture another animal by by boiling it in boiling water? And then nobody will do that. So if we live only for our impulses, we end up going towards wrong ways, towards sin, and that is bad. And we see this in every aspect of life today. I just recently wrote a, I wrote an article about a documentary film, which my movie film motion picture just made on the issue of abortion. It's called Unplanned. So this was a woman who was herself an abortion clinic uh, director. And under her, 22,000 abortions were done. And even after doing these, she never knew what actually happens in abortion. She was educated as if you know, it's just a, there is a lump of tissue in the body and the tissue is removed. So then, as one, she was a clinic director and once uh, one of, there was a sonography guided, uh, sonography guided abortion that has been. So as the embryo becomes bigger and bigger, you, know, you need more and more support to do that abortion. So then she said, she was called, there is nobody to assist, can you assist? And so after being 12 or 13 years in that profession, first time she actually went to see how an abortion was done. She was the director of the clinic. And then when she saw it, the sonography was saying, and actually saw a baby, and a fully formed baby with hand, legs, ears, and everything. And then the suction machine goes inside, and the baby is struggling to get out. And then the suction machine catches, and then systematically crushes. And it's horrifying for her to see that. That very day, she just said, I can't continue this. And she gave it up completely. So, now, somehow, even people working in the abortion industry, they are they are blinded to the reality of abortion. So, they don't even use, now, uh, they don't even use the word abortion. Now. They just uh, use various words, like the organization which does this primarily as abortion. They call themselves as Planned Parenthood. So, <laughs> Planned Parenthood. That means like a very sweet sound name. And, oh, but, but what are they doing? So, what happens? The point which I'm making here is that if we, now impulses are there in everyone. But, only human beings will give in to the impulse in such an indiscriminate way that they can become brutally cruel towards they don't approach any image. So, when we live only for our impulses, we go towards power. And that is bad. That is, can be very bad, depending on how bad, it, what kind of action you are doing, it will vary. But then there is punya. 
Punya is where we start looking at the long term. As I said, we humans have the intelligence to check our impulses, to sacrifice the present for the future. Now the difference between Punya and Bhakti is primarily in terms of how long term we see. In terms of long term, there are four categories. There is, are there four categories of living beings? We said there is Martya, there is Amara, there is uh, Chiranjiva, and there is Nitya. So Martya is we human beings living on the earth. So we have a finite lifespan, maybe 100 years or so. That's Martya. Now as compared to us, those who live in Swarga, they live for a very long time, thousands and thousands of years. So they are called as Amara. But they are not literally eternal. But as compared to us, they live forever. So it's in a comparative sense, they are called Amara. Now beyond Amara is Chiranjiva. So those who live for the lifespan of one universe, that is one lifetime of one side lifetime of Brahma, which is, which is an astronomical amount, that's Chiranjiva. Uh, now, specific terms and durations may vary depending on certain contexts, but beyond it all is Nitya. So only Nitya is eternal. So oh, by Punya, one can rise to a higher level of existence, where we can have better lifespan, better facilities, but it's only by Bhakti that one can go beyond this material world. We can go to the spiritual world where life is eternal. So the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says, A Brahma Bhuvana Loka Punaravartino Arjuna Mamu Petitu Kaunteya Punarjanma Navitite. So in 8.15 he says, 8.15 and 16 he talks about this. So this is 8.16 he says that, A Brahma Bhuvana Loka. And right from the abode of Brahma, which is the highest level in the world, Bhuvana, towards the lower hellish plants. Punaravartino Arjuna. Everywhere if one goes, one will come back again. One's lifespan will be temporary. One will have to die and take birth again. And, But if you worship me, you won't come back in this world. So the good is, the, the bad is Papa, the good is Punya, and the best is Bhakti. Because in Punya also, we are thinking of something long term. Thinking not just about myself and my pleasure immediately, I think we are only long term and that is good. But in bhakti, we think not just of the material long term, but we think about the spiritual long term. So, okay, I'll conclude this, this is a little philosophy, but I'll conclude this with one part and we can have some questions if you have any. See, there are, uh, we could say there are two broad systems of other the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. And there are dharmic religions. In dharmic religions, we have Buddhism, Jainism, Hinduism, Sikhism. So now, if you see among them, let's consider, say, Buddhism on one side and Christianity on another side. So Christianity, Islam, and similarly, they have many similarities. So Christianity accepts the soul without reincarnation. And Buddhism accepts the reincarnation without the soul. <laughs> so what happens now? That means Christians say, yeah, there is a soul, but they say that this life is the only life you have. So what happens because of this, the religion, because there is no difference between the body and the soul, their idea of religion also becomes quite materialistic. Materialistic means there are people who have the idea that, oh, if I go to heaven, I will enjoy life in heaven. So at least in Christianity, the idea of uh, heaven is like an eternal family reunion. So your grandfather and your grandmother and your great grandfather and your cousin who passed away and your uncle and your this, <clears throat> all of you will be happily reunited. So, but the idea is you, it's 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 materialism. Materialism means it's centered on the body and relationships based on the body. Now, in some some versions of Islam, that same materialism is extended even further. It's not like an eternal family reunion. Many of these jihadis are made to believe that if you kill and die during jihad, you will go to Jannah. And in Jannah, you will for the rest of eternity enjoy with 73 virgins. So now when they are 
they are laying down their lives. That is not out of love for Allah. That is out of love for those virgins. <laughs> <laughs> so what is happening? So it's basically if there is no understanding of spirituality properly, religion can also be misused. So at one level, somebody is, oh, I'll follow scripture and I'll do something. But they're doing something destructive because of that. So punya basically means we can we maybe worship God, follow some religion, but the idea is God will make my life better in this world. And punya is not bad. Punya is definitely better than pap. But it is not the best. Because Punya will not give us anything. Anything eternal. It will give us something which will last for some time, but it is temporary. Now, of course, what was talked about in uh, the, what, the way the verses are interpreted in the Quran, that's of course not what is actually said, but it is just interpreted so that people's imagination can be fired and they can be exploited for their own Western interests, for the Western interests of some people. But the broad point I'm making here is. There is Punya, Papa and Bhakti. So, any questions or comments about this till now? Yeah, thank you. Just a quick question on the last point uh, that you just made. With regard to Papa versus, uh, you know, Bhakti, the three categories that you mentioned. So, in, in some cases, yes, we, you know, <coughs> devotees distribute prasad and uh, related to Bhakti. But also, you know, there are other runas or debts that, you know, everybody owes to uh, manushya and society and things like that. So it is also recommended that we do something, you know, like di uh, digging a well and uh, so. So how does that uh, apply to devotees? Look, so can can that be doubted? Say somebody is giving some donation to a um, to a hospital. Can that be sort of uh, doubted to being spiritual if you think of Krishna and do even though it's not directly spiritual but distantly connected to uh, you know, doing some activities that are meant to be done. Okay, excellent question. So, if there is there is something like our uh, debt to the devtas or debt to the, our ancestors, and there are some pious activities are recommended, like say digging a well or something like that. So, should, how should devotees see this? Yes. So, Prabhupada in the Ishopanishad says that all kinds of isms, in the word communism, capitalism, all these isms can be perfected if they are done for Krishna. So basically now, actually this was going to be the concluding part of my class, but let's bring it on to this point here. She says, hey, as compared to Papa, Punya is, you could say, hundreds of times better. Why hundreds of times better? Like even this example I gave of uh, a family structure and of, uh, of uh, of parenting and abortion and all that. So when I and when I go to colleges in America and Canada and the rest of Australia also, when I talk with students, so many kids are from broken families. There was one boy, he was coming for my I was there at one place for almost two months and this boy was coming for each program. And after coming for four five four or five programs, he took he decided to be close to this. He said, I grew up in a foster home. And I asked, oh, what happened? Did your Parents pass away in an accident or what? He says, no, both my parents are alive. Said, really? Then, then what, why are we living in a foster home? He said, when, when I was five years old, my parents separated. When they separated, both my parents told me that you know, this marriage was the biggest mistake of my life. And you remind me of that mistake. Both the parents said, I don't want anything to do with you. Okay, horrifying it is, isn't it? You know, okay. Okay, but what is the child's mistake? You know, your parent made me a mistake, but why take it out of the child? So although he had both parents, he became a ward of the state. And he went to an orphanage for some time, but after that he was he stayed in a he was in a foster home. So now here you can say that what is the level of irresponsibility of Okay, two people can't get along. Okay, sometimes it happens. What can be done? It's not good, but sometimes we should try to tolerate. But we can't. So what to do? Is it you know at one level after marriage, say the parents make children, but at another level the children make parents. In the sense that children 
force people to become responsible. I can't just think about my pleasure and my indulgences. I think of my child. And they start taking care of the child. Now everybody has a need to nurture. A need to nurture. And if somebody doesn't take care of that need to nurture, then they will find something else to nurture. So somehow in the Western world, feminism, if you want to say feminism in terms of women should be given equal opportunities to in their career and etc., that's fine. But sometimes feminism becomes very aggressive. So what happens? There is a trivialization of the maternal role. And then, so this abortion, it is, it is it's quite clearly, it's if we look at it from a scientific perspective, logical perspective, experience, it's the baby has life. But what some aggressive feminists say is that, now Prabhupada gave simple reason if a man and woman come together without proper responsibility, and the woman becomes pregnant, and then she is stuck with the child. So she, she women need to be protected, and a marriage is a structure where they are protected. So the women say that actually nature has been unfair to us. So about the, their argument is, I was, when I first I read it, I was sort of shocked. It says, this is pregnancy is biological slavery. And abortion is technological liberation. <laughs> so nature has been so unfair to us that nature has burdened us with pregnancy. Actually, wearing a new life is a, is a special privilege. And that privilege nature gives to women. And it's such a deep-rooted need. But when that is completely distorted, society can collapse completely. So in many traditional cultures, if a couple doesn't have a child, but they feel unhappy and they try various means to have a child. You have so many kings who do various yagyas. Even Ramayana, there is Dashrata does various yagyas. So now, there are many women, they say, they don't like to say, I'm childless. They say, I'm child free. <laughs> now, if somebody doesn't want to have children, that's okay. That's their choice. But to say, when you say it's a child free, then child is a burden. It's, it's, when we just let ourselves be completely governed by impulses, no. Society will just not have not had its foundation at all. So the point I'm making here is, say the so they're taking care of the family. It's a basic, which is the basic functional unit for society. And now, now even if your family members don't become devotees, but still taking that responsibility is very important. And getting out of ourselves by that. If one takes care of one's family responsibility, that is punya. If somebody thinks that is all that is there to dharma, then that's incomplete. But we can't minimize or trivialize that. Same way, if we live in a broader social circle, then we the whole principle of yajna is that if we take something, we have to give something. So if we are taking something from society, it's our duty to give something to society. Just like, say we take amenities from the government, then we give taxes to the government. So similarly, as far as charity is concerned, so sometimes if charity becomes a substitute for spirituality, or rather social welfare becomes a substitute for spiritual welfare, then that is unhealthy. But it's not that always it has to be a competitor for that. Sometimes it can be, there's one, uh, one disaster relief organization whose slogan is God, in double quotes, God sends disasters, we send relief. <laughs> Such a horrible way of looking at things. No? It is not that God is sending disasters. It is. Now, why disasters happen, you can get into a lot of uh, analysis about that. But the point is, God is not the cause of the suffering of the world. God is ultimately the cure of the suffering of the world. So, uh, now if, some, so if somebody starts doing social welfare as a means of rejecting God, then that social welfare is unhealthy. So in India also there are some people who say, Mano Seva hai, Madhav Seva hai. Now, okay, uh, it depends on in what context we are saying it. If we are, say, if we are saying that, oh, you know, people are starving and you just go to the temple and worship the temple and not take care of people at all. Well, that, that should not be done. In most Indian temples, wherever there is opulent worship of the deities, there is also Abundant distribution of food. And anybody can come and take food in the Udupi temples, so many other temples. So we don't have to separate Manoseva and Madhaseva like that. 
So in Madhav Seva, Madhav Seva is not just going to temple and doing worship. Madhav Seva is a holistic culture which also includes taking care of human beings. You see in the Govardhan Puja, the, when the Puja is done for Govardhan, you know, they, Krishna says, offer food to everyone, offer food to not just cows but all living beings, other animals also, and not just to Brahmanas, give Dakshina and food, give to all people of all castes. So the point over there is that Madhav Seva is a whole culture which includes Madhav Seva. But when Mano Seva is separated from Mano Seva, I said, you just do this, why do you need to do that? So some people, there was one person who was considered to be called a prominent spiritual teacher, he said, but you Hindus, why do you worship? Why do you water Tulsi? What do you get by watering Tulsi? I told you, you want to spend time watering something, you water a brinjal tree, you'll get something to eat. Now this is completely utilitarian, and there is no, no transcendental understanding that Tulsi Devi is a manifestation of the Supreme Goddess of Fortune. And worshipping her. Now, is it how much water are you going to put in Tulsi? Is, that, is Tulsi a competitor to some edible food? Hardly. So, when Mano Seva is positioned as a competitor to Mano Seva, then what happens? People say, hey, I spend so much money on this. I spend money on this. But Mano Seva is inclusive, and these things can also be done within it. So, I am not with respect to charity or so any kind of social activism we could see, social welfare. See, as devotees, we all have certain drives which we get from the past. So some people might be, even before coming to bhakti, they might have a lot of zeal to do some kind of social welfare. Now, if they have that zeal, it's not that in bhakti you have to give it up. We spiritualize it. If you like to distribute food, then let's see how we can offer food to Krishna and then distribute that food. If you like to help poor people, then see what, what could you do. Maybe you could have a, you know, build some houses but have something spiritual within it. Hmm? Maybe, so there are various ways in which devotee at an individual level, if that is what they are inspired to do, they can surely do that. Hmm? Now, Shri Prabhupada started ISKCON for a primary purpose, that is uh, promoting Krishna consciousness. So the primary energies of the Krishna Consciousness Movement should be focused on the direct activities of promoting Krishna Consciousness. But devotees who are inspired by the principle of Krishna Consciousness, they can take that and at an individual level, using their own inspiration, they can do other activities. So when we do such activities, there is a standard person of Krishna Consciousness and there is an individual inspiration which we may have, which is broadly compatible with Krishna Consciousness. So the individual inspiration that we may have, we could say that is like a preference. And say chanting Hare Krishna or worshipping the deities or having satsang, this is the principle. So preferences, if we have, there is no need to campaign for them that everybody should do it. And for somebody else, who is, then they have no, they no need to campaign, don't do this. No, if you, you feel inspired, do that and do it in the Krishna Consciousness. So, when preferences are made into principles, that becomes fanatical. So, same way with respect to somebody who has been brought up in a very dharmic consciousness. And they would do some yajna or homa or they would give some charity like that. They build, uh, build a well or give some kind of charity. And just because they have come to bhakti, they don't have to stop giving that charity. Now, if somebody did not have that consciousness before, now, is it that by practicing bhakti they will develop their consciousness? They may or they may not. Because each one of us has a particular kind of body and mind, and with the kind of body and mind we have, we will function accordingly. So somebody who has just come to bhakti and they are struggling, you know, chant so many rounds, come to these programs, and do this, and you tell them, you know, actually you, you do this charity also, you do this also, you do this also. Like, this is too much for me. I can't do this. So there is no so there is no need to impose this, but there is no need to reject this also. So in general, <coughs> as devotees, we should live at the level of punya. We don't want to do punya per se, we want to do bhakti. But apart from bhakti, I mean, there are direct devotional activities, apart from the direct devotional activities, we should be living at a level of morality and we could say culture, culture and values. So Prabhupada was asked. How do we know your followers? 
So Prabhupada could have said that they chant 16 rounds, they, they follow these four regs or whatever. But Prabhupada did not say that. What Prabhupada said was, that followers are perfect gentlemen. Perfect ladies and gentlemen. Now what does ladies and gentlemen mean? That means they behave in a way that is respectable, that is cultured. That is, uh, that will be appreciated by people in society. Because people in general, they are not going to care how many rounds you chant. They are not going to care how much you fast. They are not going to care how much puja you do. But they will see how you behave. How you behave and how you conduct yourself in your day-to-day world. So that's why that is important. We cannot trivialize that. So in general, devotees should live at, devotees uh, are recommended to live at the level of punya. It's not that we want to do punya. But punya means we we are we can see the big picture and don't just live for our immediate pleasures we see the big picture and we contribute to society we contribute to nation we contribute to the family we contribute to the community and ultimately you know, contribute to krishna also. does that answer your question beautiful okay. any other questions about this yeah yeah Okay. I had a follow-up question to what sure. Prabhu asked. So sometimes that delineation between pop and punya is not so clear. For example, over here, like you have many charities or like you know the Canadian Red Cross where you can donate blood. Then there are clinical research organizations that are, in one sense, I've heard they're karmically very heavy, but then they are working towards uh, getting new medicines that will treat certain ailments. So mm. how do you know where you should invest that? Okay. Uh, can I add a question on this? Yeah, sure. Uh, can we donate to a charity when they are buying food, when they are buying, like in United Way, they are giving food, probably not sattvic foods, right? Like they may give they may kill a cow or a chicken or something, which is not evil, mm. right? Which is not? Evil in Western culture, right? Okay. I mean, killing a dog is evil, but not killing a cow, right? Okay. Yeah. That's what I mean. So, probably hmm. in the same, same uh, line. So, are we supposed to connect all our sakarma with Krishna consciousness? All the karma. Like, if I want to donate, I'll go to Prabhuji. I'll give it to him because he is handling our cargo time. Mm-hmm. And then whatever he does with that, with that okay. tracking. Okay, I think they are related questions, but they're still distinct. I'll come to them one by one. So, okay, so let's look at these two questions related. They say, if we give should we give all our charity to Krishna only or is it that hey, suppose we give charity to some uh, some organization which gives food but they may not give they may give uh, non-vegetarian food which they don't consider bad they consider that also as a way of feeding hungry people so should we contribute to that okay so there is there are three modes of material nature there is sattva, rajas and tamas and beyond them there is transcendence so uh, so broadly speaking we could we sometimes classify this as spiritual and all this as material but within material also we can say sattva is pro-devotional rajas is non-devotional mode of passion non-devotional and tamas is anti-devotional now sometimes with passion can be anti-devotional also but broadly speaking, we would say like that. Now, should we give all charity only to Krishna? Since charity is voluntary. It cannot be legislated. In fact, spiritual life is all driven by inspiration. So we cannot legislate it in any way. Bhakti Sanas Thakur, when he had taken a, taken a pilgrimage to Rindavan. So at that time, outside the temple, there were some beggars. And his disciples, his disciples, they would not give anything to the beggars. And Bhattarana Thakur said that 
you know, we may say that I will not give charity to anyone except Hari. And then eventually the time comes, you don't give charity even to Hari. <laughs> so he says that charity is not just a matter of activity. I, I, not he's saying this, I'm, I'm explaining this more here. Charity is not just an activity, charity is a mentality. Hmm? So some people say, you know, okay, I don't have enough money right now. In the future, my salary will increase. And at that time, I will give 51% of my salary to Krishna. But now, I can't give even 1%. So what happens is that the whole point of charity is not just to give money. It's to inculcate within us the consciousness that what I have got is actually not just mine. It's actually given by me to Krishna. So it's a part, it's my duty to give a part of it back. So, a, even if somebody gives a huge charity at one time, that's good, but for the mind, to, for impressions to form, now, more than the quantity of doing something is the frequency of doing it. So the frequency, if every month, or whatever, they give a small charity, the, the habit gets developed in the mind. But if once a year I give some charity, okay, that's also some habit is formed. But like a once a year, there are millions of other impressions that are already forming in mind. Somebody says, once in a lifetime I'll give charity. Okay, that's also good. Some charity is better than nothing. But as far as forming a samskara and impression in the mind, there will be very, very less. So the idea of give the prime, so what Dr. Anshalakur says is that, you know, if somebody is coming to you, if you don't give charity, then your heart will become hard. And with a hard heart, you cannot approach Krishna. So basically, now that does not mean that anybody and everybody who comes, we have to give charity. You also have to be intelligent. But it's best say, if we can give prasad, if somebody asks for food, then we can give them, uh, if somebody asks us for something, so if we give them money, then they might pick and abuse it. But if we give them food, then it's less likely that they'll abuse it. Mm -hmm. So, There's one devotee in India who is uh, who started a social welfare organization and he told me that what he does is he, whenever beggars are asking for charity, he tells them that, okay, go and clean that street and come back and I'll give you enough charity for one meal. He says, most beggars don't come back. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is that sometimes when people are in need for help, and that help should actually help them to grow, not just keep them where they are, or degrade them further. So, if if we feel inspired to give charity to Krishna, that's wonderful. But the point is, we want to develop a soft heart. And if we feel inspired to give charity to other causes, ideally speaking, if you're doing something else, that should not become like a competitor to Krishna. I give so much here, so I cannot give over here. And there should be some service you do to Krishna. And apart from that, if he has some inspiration, then the more we can Krishnaize it, the better it is. So with respect to food, you know, devotees are also working now. Uh, like say Amazon has this, you know, if you buy from Amazon, then they have some charity that you, they, Amazon will give a charity, you can donate to a charity of your, your choice. So now there are many, like the Food for Life or Discount Desire Tree or so many other forums are also included in that charity. So it's best if we can, if we cannot give to a direct devotional charity, we can try to give a, go to a pro-devotional charity. So uh, it's a pro-devotional means that it's something like somebody is feeding the hungry, but they are giving some prasad. Somebody is doing something, uh, some welfare, but they are doing that welfare in a devotional context. So if we do it that way, then that is the best. We can't really completely control how some thing that we do is going to be used by others. The Mahabharata says that broadly, uh, the actions that we choose, how do we know whether the action is right or wrong? Mm. There are three broad factors. Intent, content and consequence. Intent is, why am I doing this? Content is, what exactly am I doing? And consequence is, what is the result of my doing this? So let's say somebody uh, gives actually one of the one of the triggers for me to 
start practicing spiritual life or start exploring spiritual life was that the futility or the at least the inadequacy of social service became very apparent to me at one time. You know, I had since my childhood a lot of faith in the power of education. That, you know, by educating people, we can create we can help them create a good better future for themselves. So when I was studying engineering, at that time I joined a social service organization, social, social service organization, and we would uh, near us near my college there was a slums slum behind. So on behalf of that organization, I would go to the slums and I would like uh, offer free tuitions to the uh, to the children over there. So I would teach English, maths, history, some of this like that. So I was doing that for some time, and soon these kids they became friends and started so telling that almost every one of their houses, there was, their home life was terrible because their fathers, mostly fathers, sometimes mothers also, but mostly fathers were alcoholics. And then under the influence of alcohol, there would be domestic violence and horrible things. So then I started thinking, you know, their life, their home life is so unstable and so so insecure. So how, how much is my teaching them calculus or something like that really going to help them? So then we talked and that organization is quite flexible. So we decided to go into uh, anti-alcohol campaign. So one of my, I used to go to the slums, one of my friends would go to a nearby village. And we worked and we counseled and we got some other people to come and speak also. And over a period of time, that one small village, it all became free from alcohol. And we felt it was a great victory for us. But, <laughs> Thank you. But then, after that, one day my friend came from that village and he looked completely devastated. He said, what happened? He said, when the local elections were there at that time, okay. and one of the political candidates, he brought like two truckloads of free alcohol for all the candidates. Oh and not only the fathers, but even their sons, teenage sons, are all drunk. Oh. <laughs> it's free. Sorry? Free. Free, yes. You know, whenever something is, whenever a product is given free, that means we are the product. Except poison. <laughs> Except, Except poison. <laughs> Except poison, yeah. But uh, even in poison, they want to get us. Isn't it? So basically what happened was, at that time I started thinking, hey, you know, that at one level, I'm trying to help people. But are people uh, able to receive that help? There is something within them which prevents them from taking that help. So... That's, that's the time I started reading a little bit more of uh, self-help and spirituality. So when I read Bhagavad Gita at that time, I read 3.36. Rajan asked this question. What is it that makes us do wrong things? What is it that makes us, almost against our will, do that which is harmful for us? As if by force you are impelled to do something wrong. So then when I read that and then I gradually started understanding the philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita, what is struck is that for all of us, within us there are some anarthas. There's lust, anger, greed, and we pride illusion. And these prevent us from doing our own good, doing good for ourselves. And now, for example, domestic violence is a significant issue in, in so many parts of the world. In the Western world, it's an issue. But, and so the government makes a lot of laws. And if there is a small incident also, the, you should report to the police and the police will come and arrest the offending man. And it can become, uh, it can sometimes lead to overreaction. But you know, almost nine, there are there's many studies done, 90% of, no, no, between 70 to 90% of domestic violence cases happen because of alcohol. When people are drunk, no, everybody becomes angry. But when do people become violent? It's when, see, what alcohol does is it removes our inhibitions. We all have certain inhibitions about doing certain actions. Alcohol removes our inhibitions and then we may act in ways in which we would normally never act. So now nobody wants to talk about that aspect. Why? Because you know, that's there's big money for the alcohol industry. In ja uh, I had a friend in Japan, so he was telling me that 
in because there is a lot of workload everywhere, but especially in Japan, there's a lot of workload, so people are under stress. So they smoke a lot. And because of smoking, they have a lot of insurance and a lot of uh, the economy goes down because of people's health going down. So the the health ministry gave us strong uh, uh, recommendation to the government saying that you know we should we should create a heightened awareness about smoking and get people to stop smoking. But then there is a whole lobby of the cigarette producers. And from the government's perspective, they are giving us taxes. And this campaign against smoking, that will take our money. So that, that campaign is spread very much. So what is the point which I'm making over here is that uh, in some ways, my intent, you could say when I was going there and trying to offer that education to the children, was good. But I saw the consequ desired consequence was not coming. So then, am I responsible for the consequence? If, if, if I know consciously that this person is short-tempered. And then I end up uh, giving them money by which they buy alcohol and they become even short, more, more short-tempered and they, they attack someone. Then, now legally I may not be responsible, but still morally I am responsible. And if I give a gun to someone and that person goes and shoot someone, then legally I'm also culpable. So the point is that for us, when we are going to do a particular action, our, we have to consider the intent, content and consequence. And based on that, we have to choose the right action. So, it, now at one level, you could say a person is starving and if they have nothing else to eat and they are given meat to eat, at least they will live. And Prabhupada also said, if you are, when the devotees told that if you go to the, at that time the, uh, the Soviet Russia, and there's no vegetarian food available over there. And Prabhupada said, eat meat, but share Krishna consciousness. But which? So in extreme situations, if there's no food, even animal food is okay. But in most cases, it is not like that. So and so in most cases, some people say that, hey, if we don't eat animals, animals will grow so much that they will overrun the earth. There's no space for humans to live. <laughs> that is completely untrue. Because in today's world, animals are produced in the factory farms. Now artificial insemination is done so that animals can be produced in large number and they are produced to be killed. So it is not that the animals are growing in nature and they are overgrowing and we are going there and killing, killing them. It is not like that. We are systematically growing them so that we can kill them. So in that sense, intent, content, consequence if we see. Based on that, we can take a prudent decision. So if somebody is starving and there is no food available, okay, then at that time meat is okay. But if there is an alternative where somebody can be given something which is not anti-devotional, then that is much better. And we can try to contribute to something like that. Does that answer your question? Uh, meat eating is a karma or a sin? It's both. But Manu Dharma says otherwise, the Kshatriyas, Shudras, they can eat meat. They get karma, but not sin. Is that right? Okay. Mm. From now to time, okay. deviating, it's okay. No, okay. So, is it that eating meat gives karma, but not sin? Well, I don't really know whether you can really differentiate between karma and sin like that. Uh, basically, you could say that there is good karma and there is bad karma. And bad karma itself is called as sin. So, now, in the oh, then? Yeah, okay, I'll come, I'll come to that point. See, Pravritti Resha Bhutana Nivritti So the, this is in the Bhagavatam also, and this is also there in the Manu Samhita. The point over there is that, that, say, uh, meat eating, intoxication, and to some extent, uh, uh, promiscuity, understood sexuality. These are, the ways of general human beings. Pravrutir esha bhutana. But, nyurutis tu mahapalam. If one gives this up, then one can get a great result. So the idea is that instead of seeking the Bhagavatam, or generally the broad dharmic texts, don't give dharma as one circle. You are doing this, you are dharmic. You are doing out this, you are dharmic. You give dharma as a set of expanding concentric circles. 
So it's like imagine a pyramid. So the top of the pyramid is one small point. As you keep down, downward, 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 it becomes much bigger in the perimeter, in, in the circumference. So like that, we could say there are dharmas for different levels of people. And what is the point of having dharmas for different levels of people? That if you cannot fit here, then you fit here. If you cannot fit here, you fit here. So the idea is, it's not one zero. If you are doing this, you are going back to God. If you are not doing this, you want to go back to Him. Now we can say that for Kshatriyas, meat eating was allowed. Which is true. Now there are practical reasons for this. Kshatriyas have to do a lot of physical work fighting. And Kshatriyas are going into the forest. Now, grains don't grow naturally. And traditionally according to Kshatriya codes, you are not going to plunder. Even if there are some farms, you are not going to plunder them just like that. So then, if they are going through forest areas, and the sages of the forest can live on, on herbs and fruits and vegetables. But Kshatriyas who have to do heavy physical work, they at the least need greens. And if greens are not available, then, then meat can be eaten. So Kshatriyas could eat meat. But you have to see that Kshatriyas, what else they did? Kshatriyas were ready to give up their life uh, when the citizens were in danger. Kshatriyate iti Kshatriya, one who protects them from Kshatriyas, protects others from injury, from hurt, they are Kshatriyas. So some people want to say that I am a Kshatriya, so I will eat meat. But okay, are you doing the other, other dharma of Kshatriya? Yudde chapya pala, you know. If dharma has been protected, are you ready to fight against all odds? Most people are not ready to do that. So we cannot take, oh, this was, this was allowed, yeah, it was allowed. So the point I'm making here is that, yes, if you could say that for Prabhupada broadly, the four regulatory principles which he has given, it is it is a Brahminical way of life. Prabhupada has not just given us Vedic Dharma, he has given us the best of Vedic Dharma. So Vedic Dharma can be multi-level. There can be many concentric circles. Now if somebody may say that, okay, I want to be at the level where I eat meat. And that's what they're doing. Okay. It's okay, but Kshatriyas are doing many other things. If you're not doing those other things, then I say, I am a Kshatriya, so I eat meat. Okay, then Kshatriyas would do something, which would, many things to give them punya. And within that particular lifestyle, this was an accommodation. See, in every, uh, in every level of dharma, there is, you could say, a recommendation and there is a concession. So now, concessions should not be made as recommendations. If you go to a doctor and the doctor says, okay, you've got diabetes. So then, the doctor says, okay, you take this medicine, morning, afternoon, evening. And he says, no, you know, and don't take any sweets. No, doctor, I can't live without sweets. Says, okay, take sweets only once a week. Hey, no, not once a week, I can't do that. Okay, twice a week. No, not twice a week. No, nothing more than twice a week. Now, uh, the doctor says, okay, twice a week. And this person comes back and tells his family and everyone else, my doctor told me to take sweets twice a day. Twice a week. <laughs> and the person doesn't take the medicine. <laughs> so now, yes, take sweets twice a, twice a week. That's also what the doctor told. But that's not the recommendation. That's the concession. Recommendation is what I want you to do. Concession is what you want to do and I allow it. So, the positive activities of Kshatriyas, you know, respecting the sages, protecting the sages, protecting the citizens, protecting dharma, those are like the recommendations. And eating meat is like a concession. So, but the important thing is that, that say, for a diabetic patient, if they are going to eat sugar, that is going to have consequences. But if they are also taking food properly, they are overall having a healthy lifestyle, then that may not have that much consequences. Okay. So similarly, if one is living an overall dharmic life of a Kshatriya, and within that they are eating meat, the other consequences might be offset by that. The, 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 within that whole life, that's okay. Sarva rambhahi doshena dhunaina agnevavrita. Krasa says all, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, that all endeavors are covered by fault, just as Fire is covered by smoke. 
Okay. So we have to consider not just the recommendations, not just concessions, but also primarily the recommendations. Consider these 16 rounds is also concession. <laughs> uh, well, okay. <laughs> um, yes and no. Are the, 16, are the 16 rounds is a concession? Well, Prabhupada did present it like that, but you have to see very carefully what Prabhupada said. Prabhupada said that my spiritual master said that anyone who doesn't chant 64 rounds is fallen. But he did not say that. Even in Gaudiya, I have met many disciples of Shila of Some disciples I have met of, of disciples of, of devotees of Gaudiya Mart and Tami. It was not a standard that everybody had to chant 64 rounds. And especially, say, those who were maybe widows just living in the ashram, or those who were Brahmacharya sannyasis who did not have active preaching service. They were told to 64 hours. But the average was that it is basically, that was not, six, not 64 hours. It was 4 rounds, 8 rounds, 16 rounds, whatever. It was. So, as compared to the standard, always remember Krishna. Okay, what are the 16 rounds? You could say concession. But from a practical perspective, 16 rounds is quite a serious prescription. And if you do that, that itself can Krishna is a conscious and significant. Okay, so uh, what what was your question? The research, no? Yeah. So with res uh, I think it was answered, but I just make a couple of points over there. Say if sometimes some research is involving some killing of some animals, but some medicine is developed, some 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 further therapies or treatments are developed by that. So should we be a part of it? Well, uh, we have had. I have discussed with several senior devotees about this. I'll give one as an example. Say, organ donation. Now, should we do it or should we not do it? Now, there are different, see, there are some things in scripture which are very clearly given. And those are, you could say, imperatives. Those are what we have to do. But apart from that, uh, if there is no specific point talked about in scripture, then different devotees using scripture Scriptural reasoning can arrive at different conclusions. So, there is one school of thought which says that the body, whatever is natural course, just let it go along with natural course. Now, if the body is dying, then just let it die. No need to oh, artificially separate the body and, uh, and take out some organs from there and donate it. Let nature follow its course. The other rule of thought is that, well, do we really now, what does it mean to let nature follow its course in today's world? Now, maybe 100 years or 150 years ago, if somebody got a heart attack, then they would just die. Today, if somebody gets a heart attack, we have so many CPR and so many other forms of uh, artificial resuscitation of the body. But the person, now do we consider that interfering with the nature? No, we consider that is, that, is, that is a defibrillator is available, use it and save the person. So. Now, what is intervention with nature or intervention in the course of nature and what is simply protection of the body? That line might be fuzzy at some places. So the other school of thought is that, or other, not school of thought, the other line of thought is that, that after you, after you have died, why be worried about what happens to your body? Why be attached to the body? If with your body you can do some good to someone, what is the do it? You there's no need to be attached to the body after you have left the body also, and be worried about what is happening to the body after that. So now somebody might say that oh, but you know if if uh, we give our eyes to someone and that person uses abuses the eyes to see something obscene or something like that, will I get karma for that? <laughs> No, this is too, too extreme. Now, if you start saying like that, if I do something, if I give someone the facility and they abuse it, now we can't control what people do. If we know somebody is going to abuse, we have to be careful. Like I said, somebody is angry and I know that they are going to use a, if I give them a gun, that's horrible. But when, when there are so many variables, you can't control them. You could even take that further and we say that anybody who does anything bad, that is because they are misusing their free will. And it's Krishna who is giving everyone free will. 
So is Krishna responsible for everything bad that everyone does? <laughs> no. He's not like that. Krishna has given us free will and we are, it's up to us to use the free will. So generally, in such cases, see there is Bhakti Nath Thakur also talks about, Jeeva Goswami also talks about this, there is Shastra Praman and there is a Loka Praman. Shastra Praman is what is taught by Shastra. And Loka Praman is what is generally considered right. Now he uses the Loka Praman for example to say that there are many stories about Krishna which you may hear in Nandavan. Mm-hmm. There are many devotees who stay in Nandavan and they are associated with Rajuasi and they tell many sweet stories of Krishna. Now if you ask them, what is the scriptural basis for this story? Now there may be no scriptural basis for this. It's, it's a tradition. But now as well as those are broadly in harmony with the Siddhanta, and then harmony with the mood of Krishna, then they are fine. Even the famous story of uh, Krishna uh, uh, having a headache and the gopis want giving the dust of their feet. This is not as far as we have found. We are not found this in any scripture. But it's such a beautiful story which tells about the mood of the selfless devotion of the gopis. So there's no need to reject that. So loka praman means that if something not, we are not talking about something which is openly against scripture that we have to do it. But something which is broadly considered the normal, considered the decent, respectable way to act in society. Mm-hmm. Then should a devotee openly not do that? No, because that will alienate. Prabhupada, when he would go for the morning walks, uh, you know, there are some devotees who make slogans like, Hi, hello, chodo, Hare Krishna, Bhul. Well, okay, it's nice. But the important thing is that we have to see how we appear before people. If somebody already knows that we are Hare Krishna, then we talk about Hare Krishna, say Hare Krishna, that's good. But somebody thinks of us as religious fanatics, you can't even have basic courtesies, you have to talk about your own religious names and your God's names. And if you are alienating people, then better not do that. Uh, Prabhupada, when he had gone for a morning walk, and some people came and asked him, please, Prabhupada had a sannyas and many of his sannyas have also had the sannyas danda. So why is everybody carrying sticks? So Prabhupada said, to keep the dogs away. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> another time, 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 if the particular way to behave in a respectable way in a particular way, we do that. Mm. So that means that if organ donation is considered to be the respectable thing to do in today's world, and then if we take a stand, I'll not donate my organs. Okay, so that's a preference. If somebody chooses that, that's fine. But there's no need to make that into a campaign and you should not do this or you should do this. I said there are both schools of thought and um, both are in their own way there is a reasoning behind it. But there is no need. So in this case, we have to try to understand scripture, maybe consult some senior devotees, and then pray. And use our inner compass to do the best thing. So, I know some devotees who are into animal, who are doing some research, which is animal research. So we had a long talk with them. Should we do it or should we not do it? So then, I told them that try to avoid it as much as possible. But, as I said, you know, actually, if I grow in this field, then eventually, as somebody becomes more respectable, then they also have more influence. So, this devotee, was about seven, eight years ago when I talked with that devotee, now that devotee has become like a very big researcher in, in their field, and now they have got like full grants so that they can do animal friendly research. That means not hurting animals. So, so now if that devotee had not grown in that field, he say, I will not do this. Well, the field would not have been affected at all. People will still keep doing that. And you would have simply not grown in your career also. But in this case, they did what they had to do. They had to do it as less as possible. But eventually they grew and now they created a whole field. Oh, I mean, at least one research unit over there. So these are all decisions which are subtle and we have to take, decide them according to time, place, circumstance. So like the same fact of intent, content, consequence, we consider that. And sometimes we might do a small evil so that we can prevent a 
we can we can create a structure to prevent a bigger evil. Or if we don't feel that, we might say, I won't take this principle, I will avoid the small evil entirely. That's also okay. So it has to be according to uh, scriptural guidance as understood according to our guidance and our own intelligence, God human intelligence. Okay? Thank you. Okay, so hmm. I became yoga brushed in this class today. <laughs> so the story, I just quickly conclude with a story from the Ramayana which I'm going to tell briefly. And the lesson from that. See, in the Ramayana, in the, in the, when Lord Ram is in the forest, at that time, he goes and meets various sages. So there is a particular, the two sages who meets, they're not very well, Sarabhanga and Sudhikshna. So when he meets Sarabhanga, at that time, he is just coming towards Sarvanga and he sees a magnificent chariot in front of that sage, sage, uh, sage hermitage. And then as they are looking at it, now they are kings and they, uh, they have been princes, so they, they know big, magnificent chariots. But this chariot is far, far bigger and better. And look, whose chariot is this? It, it does not look like an earthly chariot. And then they come out. And then they are waiting and observing, and then they see a effulgent personality coming out from the army. And they feel that they the sage. As they observe, they understand this is Indra. And Indra gets into the chariot, and his chariot rises into the sky and disappears. And then when he disappears into the sky, at that time, they go forward. And then Sarabhanga sees, yes, come Sarabhanga. Uh, Lord Ram is playing the Naralu, Naralila. So he offers the respect to Sarabhanga. Sarabhanga also offers respect to him. When, when Lord, you are, you are the Lord. And then Sarvanga and Ram asks him, what is going on over here? So what happened? Who, who, who? Why did Indra come here? He said, Indra had come to me to offer the results of my Punya. He said, I have done, I have done Punya for a long time and now based on my Punya, I can go to Swarga. So he had come to take me to Swarga. Then you didn't go? He said, no. He said, my dear Lord, my Guru had told me that you would come and give me your darshan. And I consider your darshan to be far greater than Swark. So, therefore, although Indra came and told me you can come with me Swark, I did not go. And you have blessed me now. And your darshan is far bigger because by your darshan one can attain Amutattva. Not just Amaratva, but Amutattva. Immortality. No, not just... Uh, uh, not just eternality one can attain. So, the Lord blesses him and says, live for this life, exhaust your karma, and then you will never come back to this world. You will attain the eternal world. So, Sarabhanga, he was living in this world. He could go to, the, the good was going to Swarga. The best is going to Vaikuntha, going to the spiritual world. So, he, for him, the good could have become the enemy of the best. So, he rejected the good, so that he can get the best. Of course, in Kali Yuga, practically nobody is doing the kind of punya to go to Swarga. <laughs> now, almost everybody, everybody's house you go, they write below that they are related to the Pastor Swarga Vasi or Kailash Vasi or whatever. But who knows where they are going? <laughs> so, you really don't know where they are going. But the point is that yes, there is the path of going to heaven by punya, there is the path of going to the spiritual world by bhakti. And there is also the path of going down towards Adhogachanti Tamasa, towards the hellish ways by Papa. In Kali Yuga, very few people are doing Punya. So practically there are only two choices. There is Papa or there is Bhakti. But while doing Bhakti, you can also do Punya. So that the whole point of that class was that if we have to choose between Punya and Bhakti, if I start doing Punya and saying, there is no need to do Bhakti. I am taking care of my family, I am doing my family responsibilities, I am doing this, I am doing that. There is no need for me to chant Hare Krishna. Then Punya becomes the opponent of Bhakti. And Punya can take us away from Bhakti. But while practicing Bhakti, if we have come from a, come from a family which has taught us Punya, we, have, we are living in a community that is pious or virtuous, then that can be a very good foundation on which we can build our Bhakti. So in that way as devotees, we don't, we don't reject morality. But we transcend morality. As devotees want to please Krishna, and one way we please Krishna is by directly doing devotional activities. Another way we please Krishna is by living in the world in a way that attracts people to Krishna. 
and that means acting in a responsible, moral, as Prabhupada said, gentlemanly way. And that way, this kind of the parallel with the practice of bhakti can not only help us grow spiritually, but it can also help us to contribute socially in whatever roles we are playing in society. So I'll summarize quickly what I spoke. So I spoke on this topic of how the good can oppose the best and as well support the best. So I talked about the bad is papa, where we are simply driven by impulses without considering anything higher. All animals are driven by impulses, but human beings, our impulses, if we if we just give in to them, then we start using our intelligence to do more harm with the impulses. All animals kill, but humans construct slaughterhouses to kill. All animals indulge in, uh, indulge in the mating impulse, but humans can create a whole industry of abortion. So when we can become, animals don't become evil when they act according to the impulses. We humans can become terribly evil. So papa happens when we just consider impulses and the immediate pleasure that comes from the impulses. Now we humans have the capacity to go beyond our impulses. As we can fast even if we feel hungry, I will not take this food. So intelligence is the capacity to check our impulses. That means to evaluate it and then to regulate it. So now when we regulate it, we humans have the intelligence to sacrifice the present for the future. So that means that what I want to give you the impulse may give me pleasure immediately. But restrain the impulse can give me some long term gain. So now how much long term? That degree varies in punya and bhakti. In punya, say now a person can just uh, enjoy sensually and not care for anything. That is papa. And if society goes to that level, you know, parents may abandon their children. Like I talked about that boy or you know, they may have no children only or they may think that children are poor. Society will collapse by that. But when there is uh, some long, um, long term understanding, then parents make children, but the children make parents. So having the sense of responsibility in society is important. And we can say that parents broadly, only. But we can't think only that much long term. Because even that is temporary. It's certainly longer than just immediate pleasure. But even what we achieve in this life is temporary. Even what we achieve in heaven is also temporary. So I talk about the four levels. There is Martya, Amara, Chiranjiva and Nitya. So the ultimate long term is the Nitya. And that comes when we devote ourselves to Krishna and practice Bhakti. So Punya, if it is seen as an alternative to the Bhakti, then it becomes the enemy of Bhakti. Then the good becomes the enemy of the bad. So people say, Mano Seva hi Mano Seva. Then what is happening? They are doing Mano Seva and they reject Mano Seva. Then that kind of Mano Seva is bad. But if you see Mano Seva, not just as worshipping the deities or chanting, but as a whole culture in which we connect ourselves and the world with Krishna. Then, various kinds of activities, humanitarian activities or various isms as Prabhupada says, we can Krishnaize them, we can spiritualize them. And thus, when we are doing it this way, then the good can also become the friend of the, aid of the best. And while practicing bhakti, we understand that I am doing some things, I am taking something from the world and I need to give something back to the world. Ultimately, I am taking from Krishna and I am giving to Krishna, but I can give back to Krishna through various channels. And while deciding how to do charity, where to do charity, we talk about these three principles, intent, content and consequence. Based on that, we, according to time, place, and circumstances, make a sound decision. And there are certain things which, if, if somebody is already inspired to do something uh, charitable or uh, social service kind of activity, then that is a, they can spiritualize that. That's a preference. So there is no need to campaign for a preference that everybody has to do. There is no need to campaign against a preference saying that this is not, uh, this is, this is not the principle. So preferences are preferences and there is room for them. So if you make preferences into principles, that becomes fanatical. And if you reject the possibility for preferences itself, that also becomes fanatical. So there is a room for individual inspiration. I talk about dharma as like a pyramid. It's not just you are dharmic or adharmic. There are multiple levels of dharma. And some people may spit at the level of saying Kshatriyas eat me, may are they allowed to eat me, but the Kshatriya also has to do other dharma. We can't just take the concessions and neglect the recommendations. It's a whole package. And based on 
intent, content, and consequence, when we wisely choose, then through all our activities, we can stay connected with Krishna and stay on the progressive path. As Prabhupada said, that we should be like ladies and gentlemen. That means we function in the way that will attract people towards our spiritual side. So people will not be directly attracted to our spiritual side, but through our behavior and our functioning in the world, people can be attracted to the, us and then, then we are attracted to our spiritual side. So just as Sarbhanga rejected heaven so that he could get uh, Lord Ram's darshan, ultimately Lord Ram's mm -hmm. award. Similarly, if the good becomes the competitor of the best, we need to give up the good so that we can pursue the best. And most situations, the good and the best can move in parallel. Where there are some activities that are directly devotional, other activities which are devotionalized to whatever extent we can. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki. Thank you very much.